Hello, everyone. I hope you're all having a great week and as, as excited to be here as I am. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Allison Leahy, and I'm the Community Manager at Ning. And welcome to our Community Management Talk Series. A few housekeeping rules before we get started. We will be live tweeting the event and encourage you to share any comments, quotables, and questions using the hashtag NingTalk. So that's hashtag N-I-N-G-T-A-L-K. If your question is well over 140 characters, definitely go ahead and submit it using the questions feature in GoToWebinar. Submit as many questions as you like. And, um, and I think you know the most valuable part of any webinar is the Q&A session at the end. And we'll make sure to have some time to share those questions with Richard and get you some answers. Um, so who is this Richard character, you ask? Though you're hopefully familiar with him by now, Richard is the founder of Feverbeat, an online community consultancy. He is the author of Buzzing Communities, How to Build Better Active Online Communities. And he's your presenter this hour on the topic of influencing community behavior. One of the many reasons we love Richard is that he takes a scientific approach to community. His research is deep and backed by not just anecdotal evidence, but hard data and years of experience. Influencing Community Behavior is Richard's 10th webinar for Ning. 10, I can hardly believe it. We're very lucky to have Rich here with us, and he's been so generous sharing his knowledge and insight into the science of community. His last talk on conceptualizing a framework for communities had a record attendance, so you know you're in good hands. In conceptualizing a framework for communities, Richard discussed tactics for defining your community's concept and its positioning. A lot rests on having a great community concept, so if you haven't given that recording a watch, I highly recommend it. All of those previous presentations have covered strategies for generating activity, managing growth, creating content, facilitating member engagement, converting newcomers into active members, and they're all available uh, to watch um, if you head to the Ning blog at cultivate.ning.com and click the Community Management Talks tab. If you are a Ning customer, we also have another exciting offer for you, access to the Community Course by Feverbee. It's a condensed version of a professional community management course that boasts alumni from social business powerhouses such as Amazon.com, Greenpeace, Wikipedia, and Autodesk, among others. And trust me, it's awesome. So we're really excited to, um, to share this new community course with you. And we'll make sure you get a link to the course as well as to the community management talks I just mentioned. All right, I think I've gone on long enough. So I'd like to give a warm welcome and hearty hello to all the community loving folks out there. Thank you so much for carving a little time out of your day to be with us. This presentation will be recorded as well, so if you miss any part of it or just want to revisit it at a later date, you can definitely do that. And I'll be sending, sending out a link to the recording along with those other goodies I mentioned in a follow-up email later today. Um, and it will also be available on the Ning blog. So remember the hashtag for today's presentation is NingTalk. And here is Richard Millington. Thank you for that kind introduction. There's actually a question I've been dying to ask you. So we've done 10 of these webinars now. Yeah. Is it difficult to write 10 different introductions? <laughs> um, you know what? It's, uh, it's there, if you Are actually you listen to like all of them. <laughs> hours every day doing this? I don't know if it's cheating, but if you go back and listen to all of them, they're somewhat similar. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, I, I like to spend a little time giving pumping up our audience for you. I, I hope it helps. I'm sure that they, they appreciate it as much as I do. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, thanks a lot, everyone, for having me again, and thank you for being here. So today, for the 10th webinar, and I can't believe it's 10 either, we're going to talk about how you influence the behavior of the members of your community. One of the things that's really difficult to do as a community professional is to change the behavior en masse of what your community members do. If you've ever tried to initiate a ritual, if you've ever tried to get members to talk about a specific topic, if you've ever tried to get members to do anything, what you find is that it's really difficult. Members generally don't like being told what to do by anyone. I think part of the culture of the internet is that people do feel a greater sense of freedom to do what they want. 
However, there's still things that you can do to change the behavior of those that are in your community. But when you think about the power you have, it's actually very limited. If you think about what you can do that a regular member can't do, it's a very small number of things. So you as a network creator, for example, you can create content whereas other people can't. You can remove the bad stuff and then bad people from the community. So if members are doing something you don't like, you can threaten to remove them and then you can remove them. You also have the power to change the structure of the site. So you can uh, change what appears where. And finally, if you work for an organization, you have access to the organization for exclusive news and exclusive information. But these are the things, the only things, that you can do that a regular member can't do. You have very limited influence over your community. But even with that limited influence, you can exert considerable subtle influence within your community. So even though you don't have as many features as perhaps you might have thought you had, you can still do a lot of things that can give you some level of influence. So for example, if members are doing something that you like, you can give more attention to those members. And as a result, those members are both likely to keep doing it. And other members are going to seize attention and are going to also keep participating in that activity or going to copy what these members are doing. You can use things like sticky threads or bumping and generally the positioning of where discussions appear to guide the conversations in a direction where you want them to go. You can organize and host interesting events and activities within the community. If there's a specific topic that you want your members to talk about, you can do that by having a, an event about that topic. You can invite someone on to participate like we are doing today. And finally, you can find the members doing things that you like and you can give them greater admin powers and privileges within the community. But all these things give you very subtle influence. There's a much more powerful way to be influential within a community. And it's, this is important because if you want to influence the behavior of the members in your community, the best thing you can do is to become influential yourself. And there are two paths to becoming an influential member of your community. The first one is to individually become influential. And there are three channels towards doing that. And the second path is to build relationships with the members that are influential. And the path that you choose should be saying that you're very aware that you're taking. You shouldn't try and hop from one path to the next. You should pick a single route that's going to give you influence within your community. So to become an influential member, this is how you personally participate and act within that community. You can be very likable. You can reciprocate and initiate what we call reciprocation cycles. Or you can be the expert within your community, within that topic. If you're going to build relationships with influential members, you can do that by individually interacting with them or by creating an insider group of the key members within your community. We're going to go through each of these now. So the first one is to be more likable. There's a lot of information out there right now on how to be more likable. But at an academic level, a lot of it isn't verified at all. Being likable is basically broken down into two different things. The first one is to be a positive person. And by being positive, we talk about the type of person that injects positive emotional language into the community. If you listen to Alison, who introduced me for more than five minutes, you'll see that she's a very positive person. She's an excellent community manager. If you are always an optimistic person as well about activities, then you're a more likable person. If you don't criticize or complain about things, again, you're a more likable person. And the second part of this is to be a friendly person. So be, to be a friendly person, we talk about having frequent contact with a large number of members. That means you individually reaching out to members of your community and having some contact, finding out what they're doing and just trying to engage in sustained conversations with them. You want to show genuine interest in these members and respect and praise for what they're doing in your community and in general in their lives. You want to make other members feel important or useful to the community. If you can make other members feel important within the community, they're going to like you a lot more for it. 
So the challenge, if you're taking this route to be influential within your community, is to always be consistent with it. You can't have an off day where you criticize and complain about things. All your good work to be likable can be undone if you do something that is the opposite of what is listed here. So you have to pick a path and stick with that path the entire way. So you always have to be positive, you always have to be optimistic, you always have to be very friendly. And it's something that you can schedule as part of your community management activities as well. So for example, every Friday afternoon you could spend the afternoon individually reaching out to members to see what they're up to, to see what they're doing, having conversations with them, showing genuine interest with them, praising or congratulating them for the things that they're achieving, and making their contributions feel important within the community. The second path to building influence is through, is through the reciprocity. So by this we mean where you do something for them, then they're more obligated to do something for you. Some of you might be aware of Robert Cialdini's book back in 2007, where he spoke at length about the power of doing this. If you do something for someone else, even if, even, even if it's a very small token thing, they're far more likely to do something for you in return. So one of the paths to building influence within a community is to do something for a large number of members within that community. So when later on you want a favor from them, you want them to talk about a topic, or you want them to help you out with something, they're far more likely to do it because they feel that they owe you. They feel that they can trust you because you've done something for them in the past. So again, you want to be scheduling interactions with a large number of members here. Don't try and do it in an ad hoc way, actually schedule time to do it. What we found with the, with the community managers that we've worked with is that if they don't schedule a specific time to do this, then it doesn't get done. And also in your outreach to these members, try and find out what they're struggling with. You can directly ask members if you like, what keeps them up at night, what are the biggest challenges that they face. It might be relevant to the community or it might not. And then see how you can help with that. Maybe there's relevant links or research out there that you can help with. Even if it's a more or less a token gesture of help, that will still help you later on when it comes back to you. And finally, this doesn't have to be a particularly large thing. Even giving compliment or advice or other types of support can help build that reciprocity cycle. So if you're going to take this path, and this is probably the easiest one to do, then it's to say that you have to schedule as part of your routine. You have to have some sort of database or some sort of way of tracking all these people that you've helped in your community. Not so you can ask for a favor in return, just so you don't try and do it with the same member over and over again. And the third path to being an influential member within your community is to be an expert. Or perhaps not to be an expert, but to be perceived as an expert. Those two aren't mutually exclusive. So if you want to be perceived as an expert within your community, you have to consistently do these four things here. The first one is to add value to every contribution that you make. Add value to every conversation that's in the community. So anyone can participate in a conversation within a community. But not that many people can add value to that community. Not that many people can contribute something that hasn't already been included within that discussion. Point out new information, share a particular um, resource, or add new insight. Just do something that adds value to every contribution that you make. What this typically means is that you participate less, but you write slightly longer, more detailed, better research contributions. So instead of just writing your opinion on relevant topics, you're writing more about facts, things that you've researched and looked up. So you have to be adding that exclusive and new information to these discussions. This is possibly the most reliable way of being an influential member of the community. Over time, what you will find is that members come to see you as an authority figure within that community, and then when you ask them to do something that benefits the community or your company later on, they're far more likely to do it because you have established that reputation. But again, you, it's key here that you pick one path and you stick with it. If you try to be an expert some, some of the time, if you try to reciprocate some of the time, if you try to be likable the rest of the time, that's not going to work. Pick one single path that you see here and stick with that path. 
push that path to the edge, always add that expertise, always be very likable and very friendly within the community. Pick one path that works best for you. Most community managers that we interact with always try and pick the likability path. This is the hardest one to, to, to succeed at because every member is trying to do the same thing. You're far more likely to gain influence within your community by being perceived as an expert within that community or by having a lot of members that owe you a, fa a favor within that community. The second thing that we're going to talk about today, and this is going to be a much shorter lesson than what we've done in the past, is uh, group dynamics. Another way of having influence in your community is by building strong relationships with the influential members of your community. The reason behind this is because of the law of the group dynamics. Generally, the biggest influence on an individual's behavior is the behavior of other members around them. And there's some fascinating experiments that have been done in this um, in this field. One of my favorite ones, well, I think, it was by um, um, Mil was by Milgram many decades ago, where they did an experiment where they got a group of people to stare up at the sky. And after a, not too long, they found that other people that were passing by also started to look up in the air. There was nothing there. And over a period of time, more and more people were doing it. And the fascinating thing is that over and over again, people do what they see other people doing. People will give the wrong answer in a, in, the, in, a, in a classroom environment, for example, if everyone else has also given that wrong answer. So many times, people look to see what other people are doing before deciding what to do themselves. This is especially true in unfamiliar environments, like in the, like in the, in, in the community. Most people will do the same things in the same situation. So this gives you an opportunity to be very influential, or some would say manipulative, within your community, where you can influence the behavior of any member if you can influence the behavior of other members around them. And this obviously prompts the chicken and the egg scenario. How do you affect behavior initially within a community to get other people copying that behavior? And the way that you resolve that is by building relationships with the key members in, the, in your community and then getting these members to do it first to influence the rest of the community. Once these members begin doing it, you can invite or give attention to other members to the, sorry, you can give attention to these members as well and then you, other members will see these members doing it and they like to copy that behavior and so on. So what you want to do first is to identify who the key members of your community are. And the key members of your community won't necessarily be the people that make the most contributions. It might, but it might not. It's far more likely to be the people that make the best contributions. People whose contributions to the community have the biggest long-term impact in that community. Who, for example, initiated the discussion in your community that was the most popular? Is it the people that contribute the most, or is it the people that contribute the best? You might also look for members that have the best or interesting real-world experience. Who has the most expertise within that topic based upon the experience? Who has the most achievements within that topic? These might be your key, your key members instead. You might also look for members that have the most co contacts within your community perhaps those that have the most friends, or those in the real world who seem to know all the key people within your field. You might instead look for members that show the most initiative within your community. Who in your community tries to create their own group, do their own interviews, or generally make things happen within the community? Who has a lot of enthusiasm for, for that topic? And finally, you might look for people that, are the, that have the best strategic fit to what you're trying to do. If you want members to talk about a particular to topic, then finding members that have expertise in that topic or experience or enthusiasm or even strong opinions for that topic might be the key members for, uh, for, for your community. The challenge with identifying the key members is that then you have to make friends with them. And this sounds like the easiest thing in the world and it's a thing that most organizations that we've seen get horribly wrong. Most organizations, when they do their outreach to potential members and to the prospective key members, 
will begin in a very official, very insincere way. And in fact, making friends online doesn't differ that much from making friends offline. You begin with an outreach that asks a question about something that they've done in the past, about their background, their experience, or their previous contributions to the community. That makes a statement that the other member is likely to agree with, based upon something that they've said or done within the community in the past. Or you're praising a member for something that they've done or some experience that they have already. These are the things that are likely to generate a positive reply. And once you have that reply, you can ask further self-disclosure discussions. Discussions that encourage people to share their opinion about different topics. Discussions that encourage people to share their own experience and their own background and anything else that they feel particularly emotive about. And it's the reciprocated self-disclosure where they share information about themselves and you share information about yourself that actually creates trust and the relationships here. So you want to be asking further questions and look to help, mem to help the member in some way. And it's only after a certain number of exchanges, and there's never a set amount, it depends how quickly the relationship advances, but it's only after a certain number of, of exchanges that you ask the member to join the insider group or support something that you're doing. Befriending people in your community shouldn't be difficult but a lot of organizations ignore the basic rules of making friends and they do very terrible things here. So make sure that you begin the outreach with that question and that statement or praise on something that they've done. Then reveal some information about yourself and ask information about them, their opinion on a different topic, for example. And then just treat it like a normal conversation. Don't try to sell an idea or pitch anything until you've developed a level of trust here. What you want to do with the insider group is to influence the behavior, as we said, of people in your community. You want to change what members are doing in the community. So you want to come up with an idea, run it past the insider group, which is filled with these people that you've developed relationships with, and get their thoughts on it. One of the benefits of doing this is that it helps those key and the senior members of the community feel valued. On Tuesday, we did a webinar, not for Ning, about the membership lifecycle. And what we identified there is that the senior members of a community have special needs, and those needs are to feel a sense of ownership over that community. They want to feel they have a leadership role within that community. And one of the ways of satisfying that need is to bring them into an insider group. Another benefit of the insider group is that it gains invaluable feedback from members. So you, your key members, your most influential members, can tell you what matters most to them. And then you can make changes to the community based upon what these key members have said. Not just what a newcomer who doesn't like a particular feature of your community says, but by what the established regular members of your community say. And a side benefit from this is that a lot of your insider group members become volunteers that will help you manage the community. They will become the members in your community that, for example, will moderate um, different topics, they will create content, they might help run and manage um, events, they might help recruit people for the community, they might edit the contributions of other people in the community. You can use this insider group to cultivate volunteers for your community, and it's volunteers that will help you scale the community over the long term. So what you want to do once you develop that in evaluate that insider group, is use that insider group to make things happen within the community. So say for example you want to have a ritual of welcoming newcomers into that community. What you should do in this stage is tell members why you want, tell the your insider group rather, why you want that to happen. What is the benefit to the community of doing that? And then ask them a question about the idea. Ask them how you can make it happen and provide them with different choices or ask them to give you their, their feedback on the idea on how it can be made to happen and incorporate their feedback into the idea. So by incorporating their feedback into the idea, if they said perhaps the, the senior members greet the newcomers or the last member to join greets the next, mem next member to join or perhaps there's a regular roundup of the newcomers that's written by the inside, inside a group, you can incorporate their feedback into the idea. And the reason you do this, and this is really important, is that you get their buy-in. People are far more likely to buy in into an idea that they've helped create 
than one that they've had forced upon them. If you go to your inside group of your key members in your community and tell them what you're going to do, there's no guarantee that they will buy into that. And there's far less likelihood that they will help you achieve that. However, if they've been involved in developing the idea and refining the idea, then they're far more likely when you launch the idea to be the members that go out there and make it happen. So to be the members that greet the newcomers in, into the community, or to be the members that um, write the regular columns about the, the uh, top new member of the week, or, or, or run an event, particularly for the newcomers in the community that cover, say, the basic topics, how to get started within, within that topic. There's a lot of things you can do here, as long as you get those insiders buying into the idea initially. And finally, if they are the ones that are doing it, so that, say for example, you want members to discuss a particular topic within the community, perhaps some, uh, some, some advanced subject or to just steer the, con the conversation away from where it's going now. If these members buy into it, the inside group buys into it and begins doing that, then you can give them attention and recognition through the content that appears, whether their discussions make the sticky threads, or whatever else is valuable in terms of attention within your community. And once you begin doing that, you'll see other members begin doing it as well. So you have an incredible amount of influence within your community. So this is going to be a very short le uh, lesson for today. I think it was about half an hour. Um, the important thing we want you to do right now is we've set up a free course just for you. So you can access that at students.fb.com slash login. And this will give you access to a lot of the material that we've developed. And when you go to this page, uh, make sure that you click on the Create New Account. This is a Moodle-based site. So go to students.fb.com slash login and go to the Create New, the create new, uh, new Account. Before we go to questions, I want to quickly summarize the key things that we covered in this lesson. So if we go back to the past of influence here, what I want you to decide to do after this short lesson is to pick what path you're going to use to become and have influence within your community, so to, to become an influential member or to gain influence by building relationships with influential members of your community. Are you going to do that by being a very likable person in your community and following the elements and traits that you have to do to achieve that? Are you going to achieve it by reciprocity? Are you going to achieve it by being the expert in your community? Or are you going to build relationships with the key members? Pick a path to, in, to, in, to gain an influence within your community and push that path as far as you can go. Push it all the way to the edge. Always be the expert. Always be bringing the top members into the insider group. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to share that link one more time. Students.tvb.com slash login. And then create the new account here and select the new option once you're in. Okay, if you have any questions, now's the time. Awesome. That was a great talk. Thanks so much, Richard. Um, and thanks for the compliment at the beginning, too. I, I, uh, I'm I, so happy my positivity shines through. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, so we do have a few questions, mostly are around insider groups. Um, and let's start with this one from Eileen. Um, she asks, what happens when a, a member that you have spent a lot of time nurturing turns negative. And um, yeah, I can just follow up. She, she added some, you know, an, an additional point in there, you know, insider elite group members need to earn and maintain their status, right? So there are a couple of different things here. So what happens when a member turns negative is, is obviously they're quite negative. But um, what I mean by that is they're probably going to do things to disrupt you and to hurt the, the, the community in some way. And to be honest, negativity is quite unpredictable within a community. I'd be more interested in finding out why they turn negative in the first place. Is it a personal resentment? And this is, you, is, you, this is usually what it is. Um, jealousy that they're not getting something that someone else gets. Um, 
or some issue that has affected them, if they were a positive member initially and then they become negative, then that's not a character trait that they have. It's something that's happened to them and some sort of specific situation. And I would just reach out to them and ask what you can do to make it right. Um, may, maybe that's possible to fix. Perhaps it's not. If it's not, then I would remove them. Um, that sounds harsh, but it's to the benefit of, uh, of the community. You can't have people in, in there that are trying to destroy it. Definitely. And building on that, actually, that um, the idea of jealousy there, I'm wondering what about, well, how, first of all, you know, how apparent should it be that you as the community manager are consulting with an insider group and, you know, making changes based on their input? Um, what if that hurts the feelings of other regular community members who are also very active and engaged and doing great things, but maybe just haven't made it to that insider group yet? So there's a lot of really interesting things you, you can do there. First, you, you can just say, so um, you, you, like you, like you didn't get in yet, um, and maybe that will encourage them to participate more, to be a part of that group. You can regularly rotate the membership of that group. You can have nominations and, and elections to, 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 to join that group. Um, one of the most impressive online communities is, is the community for the video game called EVE Online. And the company there, based in Iceland, I think, um, they have a whole government structure of elections and nominations and elections. And it's very fascinating and interesting how they managed to pull that all together. Um, so you can rotate the membership group, um, you can have those elections, those nominations, um, and you can make it more of a community-based decision, or you can just uh, expand the membership of the group. You can have people apply to, to join the group and say what they would contribute to that group. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do there. How visible should that group be? It depends on, on, on the community. Um, if you want to have a little more fun of it, then you keep it as an exclusive group. Um, and I've seen that work more for softer subjects. Um, so, vid so video games might be an obvious one. Um, for, say, a community of practice, you might want to publish the membership of that group and say who's in it and state what the decisions of that group are and make it very clear that you're listening to the community. Because there's a clear benefit there that if the community knows that you're listening to them, then that helps a lot. So there's no fixed answer. It depends very, very much on the type of community and what you personally feel. This is more of a gut feeling I think most community managers have for what you feel is best for your community. Great, and that definitely covers part of my second question there, which was um, how or should there be a direct path to the insider influencer group? I think the idea of elections is really pretty awesome. I'll be interested to check out EVE online um, and how they make that work. All right. So, so, there, mm -hmm. so let me um, just cover that. Should, should there be a direct path? I'm generally against it. Um, so having ele 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 elections isn't a direct path because there's no specific thing that someone can, can do just by themselves to get into that group. Mm -hmm. And I've seen um, si si like situations where they say to be in the group you need say you know 500 posts in this community and to have a clout score of 300 and a rating of you know 250 on this site and people just game just game the system they create as many posts as possible as quickly as possible. Um, I'm more of a favor of the people that are in the group um, having discussions and saying like who should be in the group. But it shouldn't be that big of a deal. In the, in the ideal situation, what you want is it to be a very natural thing where you can see the members that have the most influence within the community already and inviting them to join. Okay, definitely makes sense. Um, and then let's talk a bit more about the structure of the group. It's probably very platform and community specific as well, but um, when consulting with this group of influencers, do you think having a, like a group conference call or Google Hangout um, is helpful and maybe even supplementing that with a live group that is probably private, that is hosted on the community itself? 
what I've seen work best is typically to have a private group, so like like Ning groups, um, to have a private group within the platform itself, where you have a regular process for, for managing that group. So you perhaps have, say, one topic a week, you directly solicit those um, opinions from the members that are in the community, and then you have a conclusion by the end of the group. The difference with this group um, and the, uh, from the rest of the community typically is that you facilitate this group in a much more stricter way because you know exactly what you want from the members in that group. You want feel like feel like feedback on the idea that you're proposing or the idea that other members suggest as well, and then to have a, a conclusion about how to go forward with that idea or whether not to go forward with that idea. So it's run in a more stricter way. And while conference calls are terrific, in practice they're typically much harder to do because very few people are based in the same time in the same time zone and some people want to participate when they're at work and some people want to participate when they're at home and some people have family commitments so in practice it doesn't tend to work quite that well. Right, you'd have a lot of people missing out and incomplete conversations then. Um, okay, um, let's see and then Crystal asks about special considerations for coming into an existing community as an outsider and becoming an influencer. Um, is that an outsider as a community manager or a new member? I think probably a new member. What I'm guessing is maybe a subject matter expert who's invited to join the community and maybe has more of that clout you mentioned. <laughs> Um, so just to be clear, I, I really hate clout, but I know a lot of people like it a lot. Um, so I don't know, I don't have that, that, that much experience in those situations. What we typically do are, is pick members that are being a member of that community for, for, for a long time. Um, for an expert on that, to on that topic who hadn't been in the community for a while, I think that, that could cause some resentment, um, but I don't have any examples of that to hand. All right, um, and let's see, there's a great question here from Lisa. Um, I know you touched on this a bit, but maybe we could dive back into why likability is the toughest path to influence. Um, because most members are trying to be quite likable. Um, there's less differentiation between what you're doing and what the other members in the community are doing, mm -hmm. and it's a difficult thing mentally to keep up doing. So some people, like 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 yourself, are incredibly likable, um, but then for other members in the community or, or, or for community managers, um, it's very difficult to mentally do every day to always be optimistic to always be very friendly and and to motivate themselves to reach out to dozens of members. Um, so we, what, we tip, what we've typically seen is that that's the hardest and least reliable and the most popular route to gaining the influence within a community. What we tip, typically recommend for our clients is to go down the expertise route or if they don't have a deep uh, expertise within that topic is to go down the reciprocity route. Right. Okay. And Katie wonders if you recommend highlighting valuable members in communications with all members. Would this make them feel more valued and encourage and encourage other members to base their activity or contributions on what those members who have been highlighted have been up to? The short answer is yes. Typically people do what they see other people doing and if they like the recognition that another member is getting, then therefore they're far more likely to copy the activities that help that member get that level of attention. What happens a lot in, in knowledge sharing communities is that, or in communities of practice, is that a member will, sh will share or will write a particularly amazing or outstanding contribution about a topic in a way that hadn't been considered before, in a way it hadn't been expressed before. And you'll find a lot of people copycat that activity quite quite quickly because the response was so huge to it. You mm -hmm. see this a lot on um, YouTube to an extent. When there's a popular video that comes out, there's suddenly a load of imitations and parodies of uh, of that video. So that's like an, an extreme version of this effect in action. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, yeah, I'm trying to think of ways I've seen that play out in our creators community as well. Um, I wouldn't actually mind seeing more of it. I think we've got, I think one of the things, you know, as far as highlighting member contributions, it's something I try to do every couple of weeks and definitely, you know, finding new voices, um, not wanting to focus on the same few people every week um, as your go-to is, is definitely important as well. You're kind of uh, making space and identifying those new member contributions um, can be great and a great way to introduce other community members to the newer members that have joined recently. Um, also possible through a member spotlight. Uh, all right, and then Holly asks, what is the best way to update members' contact data once a member switches his or her primary email address? He or she is likely to drop off the communication. Um, More of a... I have yeah, absolutely technology. no idea. Yeah, um, I wonder. So I get, for my understanding of the question, so a member that's part of the community has changed their e their e email address and not updated it in the community itself. Yeah. Um, I have no idea. I haven't really seen that happen that often. What, what, what we typically find is that people tend to stick with the same email addresses unless it's related to their company. So what you might might what you might want to do in a community of practice, because people change jobs like every couple of years, is have some sort of regular notification asking people to update um, their email address um, via, no via notification on the site. Um, but that's a very specific question and yeah, it's a difficult yeah, question. <laughs> definitely. Um, I think. I'm not sure it would help with the actual updating process, but I do know that there are services that you can export your member data, so export a contact list or just that list of email addresses, and it will verify uh, which ones are valid or not. But um, that won't change anything if they had, if they no longer use that e email address, then all you'll know is that they no longer use that email address, and you won't know what their new one is, right? Right, yeah, I wouldn't be able to update it for you, but if you if you know which members aren't using updated contact information, you might be able to seek them out if they are very important to you and you haven't seen them around the community <laughs> yeah, sure. through other means. Um, all right, and let's see, how about this one from Eileen again. Do you see differences in gender in the various influencer paths? For example, do females tend to take the likability path more often than men? Might be a tricky or awkward question to answer, but Eileen and I'm sure, and myself and some others, we're curious to know if you've noticed that pattern. Um, within our clients, um, I'm just trying to think. Perhaps a little bit. Just sit, just think of the names that come to mind right now. What we have seen is that people that manage a community of practice are more likely to do the expertise route, generally because they want to impress the other people in the community as well. Whereas people that do support-based communities tend to go down the likability route. Um, but I'm not sure if gender has had a big impact. Um, and I'm quite scared to answer that question as well. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Um, okay, well, I think that's about it as far as questions coming in. So, well, one more from from Liliana. Um, she Liliana has noticed better results with member engagement when sending regular notifications with relevant information um, or a newsletter. Any tips? Um, on maybe improving that process? Sure, so newsletters are really fascinating. I mean, I know this isn't the top, the top of this webinar, but newsletters are an incredible tool that most org organizations do a really bad job of. People that do a newsletter as a very boring roundup of the community, um, the latest news, tend not to get a good response from that. There are a couple of things that we've seen work really well for newsletters. The first one is sharing the best tips that are being shared by members that week. 
so where you mention members by name in that newsletter, what their tip is, and then have a link back to that community. Um, something else we've seen work well is where you do a roundup of the questions that no one else has been able to answer in, in that community, and you send it out as a newsletter. Because then that feels like more of a challenge. People are more motivated to share their knowledge because no one else has been able to answer that question. And a final thing we've seen work well is um, using that newsletter to do interviews with community members. So then ev everyone re reads it, see if they've been mentioned or see if someone else that they know has been mentioned. But make sure that the newsletter is interesting. Make sure that the subject line is interesting. Make sure that it probably doesn't have to appear on a regular basis well because people tend to ignore news like newsletters that appear say every Friday. So you might you might want to mix it up a bit. Um, but newsletters is definitely something where you should explore different things. And when you have links and that go back, if possible, change those links to uh, bit.ly links, bit.ly. So then you can track how many people are clicking on, on those links and you can see how how effective each story or each item you include in a newsletter is at getting people to come back and visit that community. And then you'll gradually get a lot of data about what's working and what's not working, and you can optimize based upon that. Very cool, great points. And I'm really glad to hear you say uh, that it's a good idea to mix it up, because typically, um, or historically, we've gone with the Friday newsletters, but every once in a while, you know, miss that deadline or just want to push something out a little quicker. Um, and I think it's true, it does definitely get the interest up um, and more click-throughs, more people reading it. Um, well, there's a, um, sorry, this will be the last thing I say. So there's a fascinating science about the best time to say publish tweets or to publish new newsletters and stuff like that. One of the common things that most people believe is that it's best to publish a newsletter between Tuesday and Thursday, you like usually in the afternoon at around one o'clock or around four p.m. Depends if you want to hit the uh, West Coast as well. The problem with with this logic now is that everyone is doing this, and so people are getting a lot of new a lot a lot of newsletters and a lot of emails and no and and notifications around this time. The flip side of this coin is that perhaps you want to pick the times that are least popular. So the weekends or or um, 7 a.m. in the morning or just times that aren't popular because there's less competition from other newsletters. This is why what we recommend you do is that you track the links. You track what time is best to send out a newsletter and see what works for you. Don't go just by what the common knowledge is here. Just play around and see what works best um, for you and your audience. Definitely will do. And um, following this webinar, I'll, I'll be sending out the link to the recording and we'll start a discussion on our creators community as well. So if you are an in customer, you can follow up with us there and share some of your insights. If you have a newsletter, what times you feel are best to publish and what types of content you put in there. Um, so thank you very much for your time today, Richard. That was a really informative session. And I hope you all go out there and build some relationships with your community members and Maybe get some insider groups going if you haven't already. So, uh, right. Thanks a lot for having me for the 10th time. <laughs> we hope you'll come back for an 11th. <laughs> um, no, we really do have a, another webinar scheduled with Richard. Um, and we'll, we'll follow up with information about that as well. Hope you enjoyed this one as much as we did. And take care, everyone. <laughs>